So we've talked about uh, levels of microbial control and the sorts of properties that various things that exert control over microbes uh, do. And uh, now I'd like to tackle one of those categories, which is physical methods of microbial control. So, in this case, physical is opposed to chemical. Physical means that there is an application of energy, of force, either to destroy the cell or to move it. And it's important to note that it could be either one. Uh, the important thing is that the area, the space, the object ends up with no or with fewer microbes on it. Whether those microbes end up dead is not relevant. If you can just get them off of it, get them out of the way, shuffle them off somewhere, uh, that works fine. Um, but either way, uh, what we're talking about is something that takes force, that takes energy. So this is opposed to chemical methods, which cause some sort of chemical reaction. Uh, generally speaking, uh, chemical methods are going to react somehow with the cell or change its properties such as membrane properties or something like that, whereas physical methods are a little bit more blunt. So the probably the most commonly used type of, um, of physical energy that's used to control microbes is heat. This is something that we've all used to control microbes. Um, there's two types of heat. I mean, there, it's all heat, but how it works and how effective it is depends on whether it's dry or wet. And generally speaking, uh, dry heat is less effective than wet heat. And uh, that seems a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but, you know, for those of us who live in the Phoenix Valley, you know, we know people come here and they say, oh, it's 120 degrees, and we say, yeah, but it's a dry heat, which, you know, doesn't mean a whole lot, but having lived both here and uh, in the Midwest, I can tell you that there's a big difference between uh, 110 degrees in Phoenix and 110 degrees in Michigan, where there's 100% humidity. And um, it, it has a, a, a much huger effect on it, at least in part because um, a wet heat prevents evaporative cooling. It also transfers heat energy to an object much more efficiently. Uh, dry heat is transferred pretty much solely by radiant energy, whereas wet heat has convection and conduction and um, as water condenses onto you, it's going to release that heat into your body, and you also get the heat of condensation, as well as just the, you know, general heat. So heat is a much more effective, uh, or wet heat is a much more effective method than dry heat for killing things. And heat can be used either as a sterilant or a disinfectant, depending upon what type of heat you use, wet or dry, and the amount of heat you use, and to a certain extent, the length of time you use it for. Uh, heat kills by denaturing proteins and disrupting membranes. That means that as it heats molecules up, uh, specifically proteins, they become more energetic, they're moving around a lot faster, and it becomes harder for them to maintain that proper three-dimensional structure that they need to function. Eventually, they become so energetic that their pieces move in all sorts of different directions, and uh, they're no longer the right shape. The same thing happens with membranes. Um, membranes are held together by hydrophobic forces. The fats in the membrane would rather associate with each other than with the water, and that's the general force that holds a membrane together. It's not a super energetic force, and it doesn't take a whole lot of energy to break it. Um, as you heat a cell, it, it, the membrane becomes more fluid, 
it becomes easier for it to move. Uh, it becomes easier for pieces of it to volatilize, basically like sections of the membrane, small, small pieces of it to evaporate, creating little micro holes. And it begins to undulate, like moving up and down and up and down and up and down because it's much more mobile. And when it moves enough, it eventually just sort of breaks and a hole forms or a tear or a rip forms in the cell and that does it. You know, then the cell just sort of spills out and it's dead. Uh, and either of these are perfectly fine ways of destroying cells. Um, fine ways of destroying viral envelopes. Uh, and they're fine ways of destroying viruses. Um, naked viruses as well as envelope viruses. It is possible to destroy prions with heat. Um, but prions are very tough proteins, so the sort of heat that would disrupt most proteins or enough proteins to kill a living organism or even a virus, um, that much heat would not necessarily reliably get rid of 100% of prions. It would take more heat than that. So it can be done, uh, but it requires more heat than just what we would consider enough under normal circumstances. So in uh, the laboratory environment, and indeed in everyday life, uh, you will encounter wet heat in basically two forms, boiling and autoclaving. Boiling is a disinfectant. Boiling kills most things. It's actually a very good disinfectant. It kills, um, oh, pretty much all viruses, uh, and most bacteria. Uh, it kills all fungi that I'm aware of, uh, as well as protozoa, although some cysts, I think some protozoal cysts might be able to survive boiling, uh, and specifically endospores and hyperthermophilic bacteria can survive boiling. Um, autoclaving is sort of like uh, high-pressure steam cooking. It means that you're putting the contents under usually 121 degrees Celsius for a minimum of 15 minutes uh, with high-pressure steam. And autoclaving is a sufficient temperature to sterilize. It kills everything. And it is probably the most commonly used um, sterilization technique in the laboratory and um, in much of the hospital. It works very get good against most liquids that need to be sterilized. Most solid tools and instruments, at least those made of metal or particularly tough plastic. Uh, because it's a heating method, anything with a low melting temperature uh, such as some types of plastic and um, also some chemicals don't work very well if you heat them. Um, plastics particularly, but also some uh, chemicals like, for instance, sugar. Uh, if you heat sugar enough, it caramelizes. Like if you, if you boil sugar for too long a period of time, it becomes caramel. There's actually a chemical change in the sugar. So uh, you can't autoclave things that have sugar in them. Um, but many chemicals do take to it just fine. Uh, of course, since it's a wet heat method, anything that would be damaged by water, like a packaging or anything like that, is a no-go with the autoclave. So dry heat uh, is less effective. It requires higher temperatures and longer times to kill than wet, uh, than wet heat. For instance, an autoclave at 121 for 15 minutes is a sterilizer, but dry heat at that temperature for that length of time won't. Dry heat has to be at 200 degrees Celsius for, I believe, like four hours for it to actually sterilize something. But it can be used to sterilize if enough heat is applied for long enough.
But because wet heat is so much more effective, and because they're both pretty cheap methods, wet heat, autoclaving, tends to be used more often. An exception to this is incineration. So an incineration is the ultimate form of sterilization. It's burning something. Um, and if you burn something, it's sterile. We do use incineration as a sterilization method, particularly with waste. So if you have bio-waste that you need to sterilize, it's not uncommon to just burn it. In the lab, you use it um, when you want to sterilize your uh, loop or your um, whatever implement you're using to move around bacteria. You put it in a flame or you put it in a vaccinerator and it gets cherry hot and uh, what happens to the bacteria on it? They get incinerated. They burn away. And that bacteria is dead. It's also useful uh, for air processing at some points or in, in some circumstances. Uh, there are buildings that will pump all of their air through a furnace, and so the entire air basically gets passed through this giant flame, and the air that comes out on the other side is sterile. Uh, you know, everything in there, any microbes, any viruses, any prions, any anything, just gets burned up. And with air, the air comes out on the other side relatively unchanged. I mean, it's air doesn't burn very well. Um, but generally speaking, incineration, while it's extremely effective and very cheap, uh, is pretty tough on materials. There's very few things that you can incinerate and have them come out being useful on the other side. So it's really only used when you're done with something, when... Um, you need to sterilize something, and you don't need it back afterwards. Uh, loops in a microbiology lab are an exception to this, because you can burn everything on the loop, and the loop is still fine. Um, but most things don't take all that well to burning. Uh, so heat, its advantages are that it's cheap and it's effective. And its disadvantages are that it often damages whatever you use it on. It also has a limited application for size. Um, with the exception of, of, of incineration, sterilizing large volumes of air, there's only so much heat, for instance, if you wanted to sterilize an entire room. You, you, could, you couldn't, like, pump the room full of high-pressure, you know, steam. Um... Autoclaves are of smallish size. You can't put large things into an autoclave very easily. Uh, so generally speaking, heat is used to sterilize small durable items and liquid solutions that won't be chemically changed. And if you have something that can be autoclaved, that's usually your go-to method for sterilization. Now, since we're talking about heat, we should also talk about cold. Um, cold is, uh, is, is, of course, the opposite of heat. It's the absence of heat, but cold does not kill as easily as heat does. You know, if you heat proteins, they denature. They fall apart. They stop being useful. If you freeze them, that's not always the case. There are some proteins that don't take freezing well, but on the whole, most of them just stop. And that's what cold is good for. It's good for making things stop. Now, if you freeze a person, they die. But if you freeze a bacterial cell, well, that's actually a pretty common way of transporting bacterial cells is to freeze them first. It kills some of them, but most of them survive okay. So, uh, if you use cold, what you're going to do is stop or slow microbial growth, but you're probably not going to kill the cells. You might even not kill viruses. So this would be a bacteria-static rather than bacteria-sidal method. Um, and if you're just cooling something down, like you're putting it in the refrigerator, it won't completely stop growth. Even normal 
bacteria will grow a little bit in the fridge. And there are some bacteria, uh, psychrophiles, that thrive in that sort of environment. So cold is not a great method of microbial control. But it is pretty cheap. And it is pretty kind to whatever it is that you're freezing. Uh, so mostly we use cold as a method of preservation, specifically food preservation. And it works okay for that. Um, as long as, as the food is in the freezer, it's not going to spoil. But when you take it out of the freezer, all of the microbes that were on it when it went in are probably still there. So filtration is a... Um, an interesting method. This is our first one that we're looking at that is using force to separate rather than to kill. So when you filter something, what you do is you pass water or gas usually through a pore. And the water can go through, but big things like cells can't. So, uh, filtration can be a sterilization method. It can be as good as you want it to be. But it's usually not a sterilization method unless you're using special industrial filters. Um, it all depends on the pore size. And the smaller the pores, the more stuff it screens out, but the more energy it takes to force the water through. So, like this one I've drawn here, this is a bacterial cell, and it can't pass through. Maybe this is a, uh, this is a 0 0.5 micron pore size. But things like viruses, they can go through just fine. Proteins, they can get through. Uh, maybe even some very small bacteria could get through. But you can have pore sizes down as small as you want. You could have them to a, uh, a, a 0 0.05 micron size. And this is going to stop viruses from getting through. So this virus goes and it bounces off. But... Proteins, at least the smaller proteins, could still get through. So, just let me erase this here for a second. You could even have really, really small pores. These would be what are called nanopore filters. These are the sorts of things that you might find for super pure drinking water, or not drinking water, but super pure water that you use to make special lab reagents or whatnot. These are going to stop bacterial cells. They're going to stop viruses. They're even going to stop proteins. And they might stop toxins. So these little dots here are toxins. Toxins are what we call small molecules. They're usually organic molecules. Um, they're, they're small. They're only slightly larger than water. They're like maybe 12 times the size of water, which is pretty small. So these could probably still get through, although some of them might bounce depending upon their size and how good the filter is. Um, filtration has a few advantages and a few disadvantages. Firstly, um, it is easy to process large volumes. Uh, but note that I said volumes, because one of the problems with filtration is that it really only works on liquids and gases. Like, you can't filter a scalpel. You can't filter your bed sheets. But you can filter water, or other liquids, and you can filter gases. Uh, 
And this is, generally speaking, if you need to sterilize water or liquids or gases, filtration is often the method of choice. Uh, with liquids, if you have smaller volumes of liquids, then you might go for heat for autoclaving, because that's slightly cheaper than filtration. Filtration is actually pretty energy intensive, and those smaller filters, um, the real nanopore type filters, uh, can get kind of expensive to replace. They can process large amounts of liquids, but when you do need to, to replace them, they can get pricey. Uh, probably the most common use of filters in everyday life is HEPA filters, uh, which is a term you may have heard or you may not have. But in sensitive places like labs, like hospitals, and um, even some uh, industrial buildings, uh, depending upon what's manufactured there, all of the air gets HEPA filtered. And the HEPA filter will remove... Uh, it's not quite sterilization, but it's very close. It will remove bacteria, it removes all dust particles, all water droplets. I think it removes most viruses, though some naked viruses might be able to make it through. And nobody knows about prions because, well, prions aren't usually airborne, so there's no point. But all the air in a hospital gets HEPA filtered on a regular basis. So does, for instance, all of the air in an airplane. Like all of that recirculated air gets HEPA filtered. Uh, I think the entire volume of the airplane gets HEPA filtered every five minutes or so. Uh, and that's important because if one person on an airplane was sick, that air is going to get everywhere through that airplane. And if you weren't going to filter that out, then one disease would just spread to everyone on an airplane, which is something we would really like to avoid. Uh, so the filtration regimens on airplanes are, are pretty serious, and they are stuck to pretty well. Uh, so we've talked about heat, we've talked about filtration. Uh, the last thing that I really want to talk about is radiation. And we're all pretty familiar with radiation. It lives among us and surrounds us, but mostly we don't really notice it. Radiation comes in two varieties, ionizing and non-ionizing. And the non-ionizing form is totally not dangerous. Well, not totally. But it's mostly not dangerous, and it's something that we, surrounds us all the time. Uh, visible light is non-ionizing radiation. Radio waves are non-ionizing radiation. Infrared is non-ionizing radiation, so like basic heat is. And all of these things are fairly benign. Uh, ionizing radiation, on the other hand, and this is ionizing radiation that I'm specifically talking about here, is what we think of when we think radiation that causes mutations. And that's how it's going to sterilize things. So, uh, these are going to be gamma rays and electron beams. X-rays work as well, but... They aren't usually used because uh, they don't have as much penetration value as gamma rays, and um, they just aren't quite as useful for this particular purpose. Uh, but gamma rays and, and electron beams both are ionizing forms of radiation, which means that if they hit something, they will break a chemical bond. If they, what they hit is DNA, they're going to break the DNA in half. And that's usually a pretty nasty mutation. It usually leads to death. At least if it mutates an important gene. Ionizing radiation is very useful because it can kill things without damaging non-living stuff. It's pretty specific in that it damages DNA uh, more than it damages a lot of other things. Well, that's not entirely true. But the damage, a little bit of damage to DNA goes a long way. Whereas you have a little bit of damage to something else, like, say, some wood or some paper, is not going to be noticeable. So you can have many packages of something, and you can zap them with radiation, and it will kill everything in them, but it will leave the item fairly untouched. 
The other thing about it is it can move through solid objects. It has a high penetration value. So if you're in a hospital and like you see the uh, the nurse takes a, uh, a needle out of a, a paper package and you think, well, how did that get sterile? Because the needle's sterile. You know the needle's sterile. They don't put non-sterile non needles in people. Uh, how did it get sterile without destroying the package? I mean, they didn't autoclave it, right? You can't autoclave a paper pl uh, uh, package. It would get destroyed. They didn't filter it. What they did is they radiated it. And the radiation can pass through the needle, the plastic, the paper, and kill everything in there without damaging anything. Now there's two, these two types. Gamma radiation has a very high penetration value, but it takes longer to work. And by longer, I mean like a couple hours. Um, usually what they do with this is they'll have like entire boxes, like a whole pallet of boxes of something, and they'll just irradiate that entire pallet for a couple hours. I get everyone out of the way, of course, because radiation, you know, it kills bacteria, it kills you just as easy, easier. Um, but it doesn't stick around afterwards, so you don't have to worry about anything being left on it, no residue or anything like that. And gamma radiation can go through like a meter of concrete. So going through a big stack of boxes is no problem for it. Uh, and it can kill things all the way on the other side of that big stack of boxes. But like I said, it's, you know, it takes a little bit of time. It's not something that happens quickly. Electron beams, on the other hand, are very much faster. They kill in a matter of, well, less than a second. Um, but they have less penetration value. Now, it still can penetrate things. And it still doesn't cause much of a change to what it's hitting. But a, um, an electron beam can penetrate something like a thick piece of cardboard. While gamma radiation can penetrate a meter of concrete. So anything that is thin will often get sterilized with electron beams. Now, um, probably the biggest use for electron beam sterilization is in the mail. Uh, if you recall back a number of years ago, there was the whole anthrax in the mail scare. And some people working in government offices got letters full of anthrax, a couple of them died, there was a huge freak out about it. And nowadays, all mail going to supposedly important people like the president and senators and uh, you know Supreme Court justices and things like that, they all get irradiated before they arrive just in case somebody's screwing around. And so all the letters that are going through like file pass, single file, and they pass through this electron beam. They're going, shunk, 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 really, really quick. And uh, the electron beam just sort of passes through each of them. And because it kills so fast, you can process a lot of letters very quickly, and it will kill any anthrax or any whatever inside of them. This works well because letters are relatively thin. An electron beam has no problem passing through a letter but it wouldn't work with, say, a shipping crate. Uh, it'd get, like, six inches into the shipping crate, and then it wouldn't have any killing power left. Uh, so those are the two types of radiation, of ionizing radiation, um, that are used, and both are relatively expensive. This is one reason why scientific equipment and medical equipment is so expensive, I mean, the needle, it's, it, needles are a lot more expensive than you would think based on what they are. They're a little bit of plastic with some sharp metal at the end. That's not difficult to make. Um, but the sterilization procedure and keeping them sterile and the testing to make sure they're sterile, that's where it gets expensive, actually. And that's one reason why you would pay a lot more for medical supplies than simply the manufacturing costs. Now, the one type of radiation that 
is non-ionizing but is still useful for controlling microbes is UV radiation. Now, UV radiation causes mutations, but it doesn't do it through uh, through breaking chemical bonds. It does it through creating thymine dimers. Uh, and it only affects DNA, and it only affects particularly um, DNA that has two thymines together. This is how it happens. Uh, and uh, uh, this is talked about in greater detail in the section on mutations and bacterial genetics, but uh, its use as a control is, it's not a sterilant. There are plenty of organisms that can just deal with UV. They have repair mechanisms, or they just don't have very many thymine dimers in their DNA. Um, and things like endospores and uh, prions just laugh at it. But UV is a fairly good disinfectant. Uh, it's sort of a medium-level disinfectant. And it's mostly used... Uh, to make sure that clean surfaces remain clean when not in use. So, like, let's say you've got a room, like a surgical theater, and it's clean. You want to make sure that it stays clean when there's no one in there. Often they'll flip on the UV light, and the whole room gets bathed in UV. That just makes sure that no inadvertent microbe is going to get in and settle onto a surface. Um, similarly, I've seen in like surgical theaters when the the surgeon like wants to set a scalpel or a something down and uh, you don't want to set it down on a place where it could get dirty he'll set it down under this thing that's like bathed in UV light um, with micro hoods uh, that are supposed to remain sterile usually there's a filtration system and a bunch of airflow that uh, that keeps it sterile, but that airflow and that filtration gets expensive after a while when you go home for the night. You shut the airflow off and you close the lid, but you want to make sure it remains sterile, so you turn on a UV light in there. And the UV light will keep it pretty sterile for an extended period of time. Uh, UV radiation has some advantages and disadvantages. It has no penetration value. So like gamma and, and electron beam, we said like gamma radiation penetrates a meter into concrete and electron beams can go a few inches. UV does nothing. All it does is it hits the surface. It's blocked by a piece of paper. It's even blocked by glass. Well, most of it's blocked by glass. Um, but it is inexpensive. Very inexpensive. You can keep UV um, bathing an area for hours without, you know, with only a minor electrical cost. It's also fairly safe. I wouldn't look directly into it, but uh, it's non-toxic to the environment. It doesn't stick around for very long. So I saved this for last because it's not really the same as what we've covered though thus far. Uh, this is something that's mostly used as a form of preservation. Uh, drying and desiccation. They both basically mean the same thing. They mean removing the water from an object or from an area. And all life is basically water-based and most life will not thrive very well if you remove the water from it. Some things are pretty good at keeping track of their water even when you try to remove it from it, but this is an ancient technique for preserving things. So, uh, we're all familiar with dried meats, right? Like, uh, um, beef jerky or something like that, or dried fruits. And if you, like, leave uh, an apricot on your table for six months, it's going to rot. But you can have a bag of dried apricots in your cupboard for years, and it's probably still fine afterwards. Maybe a little stale, but probably not rotting. That's because you've removed the water from it, so any bacteria 
are going to have a hard time living on it. There's basically, you know, kind of two philosophies here. You can just remove the water from something that's drying it, um, and that works with, like, oh, you know, like jerky, or even things like rice or grain or stuff like that. Like you can store flour and rice and, uh, and even sugar for long periods of time because they're dry. There's no water in them, so nothing's going to grow. The other way that you can do is you can use osmotic pressure. It's possible to dry something out while keeping it totally wet. That doesn't make much sense, but it's true. Uh, and you would do that by keeping it in a um, hypertonic solution. That basically means you use osmosis uh, to drive the water out of the thing and into the surrounding water. You make sure that there's more stuff, salt or sugar or acid or whatever, surrounding something than there is inside of its own cells. And the osmotic pressure will drive the water out of it. This is what we do with pickling and preserving. When you pickle something, you put it in a high salt solution, and that salt actually draws the water out of the organism. And any microbes trying to grow in there will have a very difficult time because um, even though they might you know, normally want to eat that cucumber or that whatever that you have pickling, um, all of the salt around them is going to draw water out of them. Just like if you drink salt water, ocean water, or sea water, you'll actually die of dehydration. So no matter how thirsty you are, if you're stuck on a desert island, don't drink the sea water because you'll actually die faster. Uh, it'll draw water out of you. Preserving is much the same thought, except instead of salt, you're using sugar. So when you preserve fruits, and some vegetables, but mostly fruits, um, the fruits themselves have a very high sugar content, and you're going to help draw that sugar out of them. You're also going to add more sugar, and you boil it down and render it down so that it's in a very high sugar concentration. And there's so much sugar around there that it will draw water out of anything trying to grow in it. So very few organisms, but very little bacteria, can grow in either pickled or preserved solutions. Fungi, especially molds, can often deal with that sort of thing. Uh, and they will still be able to grow, or they may still be able to grow, slowly. Um, but, uh, yeah, pickled, pickled vegetables and preserved fruits almost never have problems with bacterial contamination, but, um, if you try hard enough, you can get fungi to grow on them, and, uh, my efforts at home pickling, uh, will attest to that. Okay, so, uh, a little bit of a quiz here. Uh, what method of physical control would be the best choice to use on a surgical scalpel? And we have a bunch of options. Autoclave, UV radiation, filtration, boiling, drying, gamma radiation, freezing, or incineration. I should point out that several of these methods would work but one best fits those criteria that we talked about last time. Um, you know, expense, effectiveness, time, everything like that. So I'll give you a few seconds to, to pick on your answer and then I'll give you the right one. Okay. So the best answer here is autoclave. Let me put a circle around there. Autoclave. And that's what's generally used. So uh, UV radiation is out because it's not a sterilization method. Neither is boiling. Uh, 
Filtration can be a sterilization method, but then the question is, how are you going to filter a scalpel? It only works on liquids and gases, which a scalpel is not. So, boom, that's gone. Uh, freezing and drying are also not sterilization methods. They're mostly preservation methods. Incineration mm, would be a possibility depending upon how hardy the scalpel is, but it's probably going to result in the destruction of the scalpel. Gamma radiation is an acceptable answer for this. If this were a test question, I would probably give half credit for gamma radiation. Uh, because, and, and, and let's put a little question mark after that. Partial credit. Um, it would work. It would work fine. It would certainly sterilize the scalpel. Um, it takes longer than autoclaving, and it is more expensive than autoclaving. So, autoclave is going to be the best choice, but gamma radiation would still work. And that's my view on, on, if this were a test question, how I would probably deal with it. Alright, so uh, I will see you next time for chemical methods of microbial control.